welcome to this week's Fireside Chat with Jesse. I'm joined today by Howard Sheepler, President of Crossroads Equipment Finance. Thanks for joining me, Howard. Nice to be here, Jesse. No, nah, it's uh, great to have you on the program, sir. I think you and I have known each other for several years now and um, looking forward to sharing your and Crossroads story with our audience here. So um, I guess I'll just kind of jump right in and just ask you to kind of introduce yourself and your career in equipment finance, sir. Yeah, sure. Well, I've been at it a long time. I uh, am now just hit my 40th year in equipment finance. I started in it out of, out of college, was lucky enough to get in with uh, GE Capital into a nice office in New York. And it's funny because my first job was doing vendor finance, doing truck business, and most of my career was not spent doing that. And here I am back in the same space that I started. Um, and here we are 40 years later. And actually, uh, I'll tell you, not that, that much has changed in terms of, you know, what, what it takes to build a good company and what it takes to have success in the marketplace. But I spent a good chunk of my career there. I actually left GE Capital twice. I spent a total of 25 of my 40 years there. Um, but I left a couple of times. Uh, once to pursue some passion that I had for sailboat racing. Uh, and uh, and they were nice enough to let me come back. I tried to make the U.S. Uh, Olympic team um, and uh, got close uh, to uh, uh, to winning the Olympic bid, but uh, didn't get there. But um, And then uh, GE had me back. And I, I did a variety of things at GE from uh, truck finance, um, other equipment finance, running one of their regions, uh, doing corporate aircraft finance, which was fun because I happen to be a pilot as well. Um, and and then other areas of secured finance, you know, GE Capital, when I joined the company, uh, made $44 million net that year. And at its peak, it made over 10 billion net. And, and so we were on a growth trajectory that I was lucky enough to come on board at the beginning of that created a lot of opportunity for professionals there because the biggest challenge that they had in growth was finding the leaders that they needed to, you know, to step into either acquired businesses or organically grown businesses and, and grow them. And so it was a great time to be at what I thought was going to be a big corporate environment and turned out to be a really entrepreneurial, fast paced place that gave me a lot of opportunities to learn a lot in a lot of areas of secured finance. Uh, so I feel yeah. quite. I was at my, yeah, I mean, the GE story is phenomenal through training and everything else. How did you, how did you stumble into GE out of college? Uh, really, I went to University of New Hampshire. I stumbled onto them trying to get into their financial management training program. Huh. Um, and and oddly, I didn't go into that program because I came across, I was working for my dad who sold trucks and came across a financing document that they had done. And I called their office and they were hiring and the guy hired me and and, and off I went. Uh, and so, um, so much for planning your career, right? Um I just kind of stumbled into it. I don't think I even knew equipment finance existed uh, uh, at that point. Uh, and so I was lucky because it was, you know, I was in a fast growth company at a good time when the economy was starting to crank again. And uh, and I was around a lot of great, smart people in a good company. So I felt very fortunate. And, you know, I left the company twice. Once I, I mentioned already, uh, and another time I left and pursued um, uh, doing a startup, which was really fun. We raised a bunch of equity, spent all of it, um, and didn't successfully kind of um, get the windfall of some of the bot dot com uh, boom era of the late '90s, early 2000s. Um, but it was really, it was really a great way to apply some of what I had learned uh, to try and build a marketplace in equipment finance. And uh, I think maybe we were a little ahead of our time and didn't have the formula right. Um, because uh, today I, I see folks trying to do the same thing. Um, uh, but then GE asked me to come back again. Um, and uh, I, so I spent my last uh, my last uh, six or seven years of my working years until GE Capital started selling off all of its businesses. So um, yeah, and, I mean, um, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. and then in 2017, 
uh, I took the role with Crossroads uh, when GE Capital, you know, it started selling off their businesses. Um, they early retired me, um, and uh, I met the folks that own the company, and and here we are seven years later. So having having as much fun as I've ever had actually doing what I'm doing at Crossroads. That's awesome. Um, I want to go back to GE if you if you don't mind. I mean that 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 that, that training program um, that you probably went through. But starting kudos for you for seeing that invoice or statement and being like, huh, <laughs> it's a great yeah. sales job to get a, to get to get an interview, and we took it from there. So Howard, from um, you know, from a training perspective, I mean, uh, I've had multiple people on here that have been through the GE training program. Um, you know, it's not really something that's a uh, that you see or even hear of. Um, and nowadays where it's, you know, they want you to start, they basically want you in all aspects of the business, um, you know, before you kind of settle in what, I guess, swim lane you're going to take moving forward. Um, what are your, what are your thoughts on that training that you had, uh, coming into the industry and kind of where things are now, sir? I think that might be giving it more, uh, the appearance of more structure than existed. You know, I think GE always had a culture, even when GE Capital, uh, before that GE Credit is what it was called, when it was really a captive to finance GE products. I think culturally GE was always a very high integrity place that focused on leadership development, even pre-Jack Welsh. Um, and when GE Capital started growing rapidly, um, that filtered down into the executive team, I think, of GE Capital. And there was a big focus on executive development um, and, and even development at the entry level. And so, um, you know, there was not a structure that said you needed to work in all these different functions before you could get to a certain level or check a bunch of boxes. I think all of us had different experiences there. Uh, but there was a big focus on leaders uh, taking their direct reports that they thought were high potential and making sure that they injected them into training opportunities um, at Crotonville and in other places uh, to help accelerate their careers and really try and separate out the top leaders from the rest. Um, mm -hmm. And um, because there was a core belief that without the development of those leaders, we can't continue to grow. And um, and so, you know, if I had direct reports, I, it was a big expectation on me to make sure I developed them. And and however that manifested itself in the training was OK. Uh, you might have had a different view of how to go about that as a leader than I did. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, but I think just the focus on it that says your job as a leader is to develop the next leaders and to invest in them and give them opportunities and stretch them, put them in roles where they're perhaps uncomfortable or having to do things that they haven't done before, sure. um, I think was part of the development. Uh, you know, I got put into some jobs where I honestly thought, did you guys get the wrong name here? Because... Have you looked at my resume in this job? Because those don't match up very well. <laughs> and um, but they said, no, we got you. And, you know, uh, you know, I I went from a job where I was leading 25 people into a job where I was leading 800 people in one step wow. and in a completely different space than what I grew up in. And um, and and that was that was a pretty big challenge for me. But you know, immediately I had leaders above me saying, we know it's OK. Um, we know you're going to dive in and learn from this. Um, they even gave me an executive coach right out of the blocks. So it wasn't one of my bosses uh, that I could lean into uh, for help. And um, and they were behind me. And um, and so I think culturally, just the focus on the importance of leadership development uh, allowed a lot of things to evolve in a lot of different ways um, that helped grow a lot of really good professionals. Um, and while you might not think we we have that, um, 
I do, I do get a sense now that I'm a deeper part of Alpha, that um, I've met a lot of leaders that I think that are believers in that. Um, of course, there's a lot of GE leaders out there now that are in different jobs too, that probably are, 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 are a share in that Kool-Aid with others. But, um, you know, I, one thing that's consistently been there through my career is when you're around good people, um, you seem to be able to have success and it's less about your strategic formula and more about whether you got quality people uh to execute on whatever you're being asked to do and when you don't have the good people um then it's really really hard you know I've, i saw us do acquisitions and make the mistake of scaring off the the culture of the acquired company and having key people leave and see those businesses fail um and we thought well how could they fail they now have the ge banner behind them all the capital that they need they were a good business before. Well, it failed because you lost the key people that were the drivers to the success of it and the formula that made that work. And so we learned a lot of hard lessons that way um, sure. that uh, people are pretty important. Well, we hit on so many, so many good topics there. And the last one is, the last one's crucial, right? I mean, I think we've seen even some of those acquisitions over the last three to five years, obviously, post-GE, where, you know, organizations come in and they just, well, this is my company now, and you kind of see what happens to that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't usually work that well. No, no. I mean, because while the product's important, the people with the customer relationships, the people managing those relationships are even more important. <laughs> That's why you pay a premium for said organization. And if those people are just gonna leave, what's most likely gonna happen down the road? Yeah. So, um, so thank you for thank you for that, Howard. And um, so how did you convince GE um, to let you go uh, fulfill your dream and, and try for the Olympic team? Was that a conversation oh, well, was... morning? You're like, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go do this. I'm gonna take a swing. It wasn't a very easy conversation because I had just been promoted into a sales leadership job and uh, my first manager job. And a month later I said, guys, I've got to leave. And, um, and they don't leave those jobs open. And I left for a year and a half. And so it wasn't like I was taking sure. a couple of months off. And so, um, but you know, if you, if you do a good job somewhere and you're well-regarded and you handle things professionally, um, I think you don't burn bridges. And um, after I made my efforts on the Olympic side, um, there were openings in the business and people knew I was maybe back in the market and and uh, and they offered a, an opportunity for me to come back. And so um, uh, it wasn't it wasn't wasn't any more complicated than that. Okay. Sorry, I had to ask that. That's a it's a really cool story. <laughs> Um, all right, sir, do you mind uh, introducing Crossroads? Yeah, Crossroads was really interesting. I uh, uh, It was a very small company in Los Angeles. I had just moved to Santa Barbara after leaving Canada in my last GE role. And I met the two owners. And had I not met the two owners, I, I'm, I'm certain I wouldn't have taken the role. Because if I looked at the the company and what they were doing, it was not even on my radar to do something like this. Um, but I really liked the individuals a lot. Uh, they wanted to give me a lot of freedom to build an independent and they had a small kind of starting point and had successfully built up their own truck dealership group called Velocity Vehicle Group. Um, and they had this little captive. And so when I started, it was a couple hundred million dollars worth of assets, all financing just the sale of Velocity Vehicle, uh, about 30 people. And, um, and we, we started just investing in the fundamentals. You know, did we have good infrastructure in terms of everything from the basic systems and documents and processes to do what we were doing well and safely? Um, but then pretty quickly investing in the leadership uh, team that would be required to be able to manage 
the business well. And so um, we've been lucky. We've um, we've uh, uh, we've grown quite a lot. Uh, we're up to about a billion in assets now. Um, we have about uh, 175 people, actually about a billion four in assets, because I would combine the assets of Crossroads with the assets of a business. They had just ac acquired an SBA lending business that we now call Velocity SBA, uh, but it didn't really have an active team. They weren't doing any business uh, and it had a bad portfolio, um, but they had acquired it for the license. And that business is now 35 or maybe close to 40 people now um, wow. and growing well and about 400 million in assets and um, doing 15 to $20 million a month and with a national sales team. And we run that business separately, but share some resources like finance and IT uh, and HR between our two businesses. Um, and uh, and then the Crossroads business that has another 130 some odd people in it now, um, a fairly good sized sales force. And, um, and we're, you know, we're, it, it's funny because some of my former GE colleagues ask, well, when are you gonna get beyond doing trucks? And uh, I thought by now, if I would have bet back in 2017, I would have bet we would have been in a lot of different spaces. Yeah. Um, but um, somebody wise told me once, you know, do do less and do it well, um, instead of, you know, having the desire to feel like you have to have your hands in a lot of things. And um, when when building the independent, I realized without the foundation, I can't do other things. I can't do acquisitions. I can't get into other spaces if I don't have, you know, a sound organization with the right systems and processes and teams and executives that would enable us to do that. Uh, and so here we are still in the truck space. We've managed to get into a position where I think we're nicely recognized in the space. Um, and we've developed a lot of expertise in it. And it's, a, it's definitely a cyclical space. And so if you don't have the expertise and really focus on it, you can get burned pretty badly. Um, and um, we're experiencing that now. You know, we're in a terrible truck recession, the worst I've seen since 08, for sure. Uh, this lasted over two years. That was, uh, without getting too deep into that, was a little COVID-induced just kind of a bad cycle of supply and demand that we haven't uh, worked through yet. And we were fortunate enough to kind of see those storm clouds and and get a little conservative and protect the business. And so we've been able to play through it and, and remain profitable. Uh, and a lot of our peers that only dabble in it, um, meaning it's one of their many collaterals, um, missed some of the unique attributes of this cycle and sure. are taking higher than expected losses in it. And so um, I think I think specializing in transportation has helped us a lot and um, and 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 helped us, you know, not only define ourselves from a customer perspective as a good provider in that space, but also uh, to keep the place safe and get good risk adjusted returns. No, um, uh, thank you for that, Howard. And yeah, I mean, you sit there in 2020 and as you mentioned, transportation's always been cyclical. Uh, it was almost like it was flatter and then COVID just made it go like that. Um, and then you, know, you get like you nail on the head, these organizations like, oh, look at those residuals. Oh, look at that. Oh, we can make money in trucking. And now three, four years later, they're, it's not their core competency. They were just dabbling in it and just kind of is what it is, right? Yeah. <laughs> But, um, but a lot of good points there, sir. Thank you. And then from, um, from a location perspective, I know you guys are in Southern California. Um, do you have resources throughout the, the states as well? We do. And, you know, COVID uh, introduced us, of course, to the, the world of remote work, right? And um, I was rather shocked how quickly we were able to embrace that and still be fine. Um, you know, we had no choice, of course, um, sure. in California, it wasn't even an option. And, um, and then once the dust settled a little bit, we decided to go to a hybrid work environment. So we now, 
are two to three days in the office. And, um, you know, we have our, we have offices in Rancho Cucamonga, which is over near the foothills, uh, Ontario area, uh, very east of LA, and also offices in Pasadena and, and over in Costa Mesa. And so kind of around the LA basin. And we allow any of the employees to work in uh, any of those offices. And we opened up uh, about 18 months ago, opened up an office in Dallas and are trying to plant a regional flag there. It's a great place to live. It's a great place to recruit talent. Pretty much everybody in the equipment industry, equipment finance yeah. industry has got a base camp in Dallas. Um, and we'll likely, you know, build further base camps. We have a lot of people in Chicago, um, but no office there. Um, that'll probably change in the near future. And I think, yeah. you know, our, our, our view is we want to recruit the best talent and, in, in kind of this new environment, have the blend of the flexibility of being able to live and work where you'd like to live, um, but also get people together, have them come to the office. Um, like it bothers me, I've got nearly a dozen people in Chicago and I don't have an office set up there. And I know we'd be better if they were there together a couple of days a week, cause they'd be feeding off of one another. Um, particularly, you know, as you try and recruit new people into the space um, and develop them, I think it's really hard for them to develop at the pace and get to know their colleagues and learn from them if they're working only via Zoom or Teams. And so uh, we're trying to make that work. I think, I think it's made it um, very different for leaders. I think leaders have to be better because it's more challenging to lead a remote workforce. Uh, and I think you have to be both creative uh, and attentive to how do I create a team? Uh, how do I keep people engaged? Um, how do I, you know, how do I make sure that they're owning up to their their part, they're, they're pulling their load? Um, but um, I think it's very doable. It's actually made us, I think, better in ways we hadn't planned for uh, as leaders because, you know, you get a little more focus on on metrics. And it's so funny because I, growing er, up early in my career, I was always hearing people talking about what are your numbers, what are your metrics? And I thought, you know, why don't you leave me alone with all that noise and let me just do my job. And, um, but, but as I've gotten uh, a little older, I've realized actually that, you know, the metrics, you know, help tell a story and help you stay focused on the right things. And with a remote workforce, kind of measuring how things are going is is a way to keep everybody connected and, and focus on the outcomes that you're looking for, whether it's making sure you're delivering approvals quickly um, or outcomes for the customer, um, or even looking at, you know, errors and differences between, you know, how you and I might work as as peers in the business to learn from one another. So, um, yeah, I think, um, I think it's been interesting, but, you know, we've tried to turn it into a positive part of our culture. Sure. Um, yeah. And that's, I mean, you mentioned that the, the, the culture word, right. Um, you know, it's how do you build these cohesive units if they're in different, you know, cities throughout the country. But um, I like that where it's like, hey, here's home base, here's an office, go do it, collaborate. Um, you know, because the sales organization that I started with in the Northeast, like you, in office, let's go, you get the camaraderie, you get the team building, you get everything else. I think of trying to start that job now, kind of just being on an island by yourself. You're, you know, you're not learning kind of best practices. It's like, hey, let's just figure out what works for you. Right. So, um, a lot, right. a lot of good takeaways there, Howard, for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, the next uh, topic of conversation we're going to have is um, is kind of the ELFA, um, you know, that, that trade organization and kind of what it's meant to um, um, to your career. So, um, you know, just what it means to Howard as an individual and then what it means to Crossroads, sir. Well, I would say growing up in GE Capital, um, I barely knew what it was, um, okay. honestly, for most of my career there. Um, and, um, you know, we weren't 
encouraged to participate in it. It was kind of this thing off to the side um, and we were doing our own things. And, and Lord knows we had enough things going on internally at GE to, to keep our attention, right? Um, I think um, though now post GE, um, I'm, and I, and I spent a little bit of time in the organization when I left in the early 2000s and did the, did the dot-com thing. Um, and I think learn more about the association. And I think it's one of the best associations in any industry. Um, I think there's been a commitment to the industry, to excellence, to leadership development, to sharing ideas that I haven't seen anywhere else in other associations. You know, a lot of associations, I think, give a bit of lip service to that. Um, and people just join associations maybe for relationships. But I think there's a lot to gain, particularly because we find ourselves in an environment now where, you know, there's so there's so much change going on in the bank space. And, you know, I would say there's this general trend towards we're going to have less bank capital and more private capital funding uh, the equipment finance world. And that's going to lead to more and more new companies, small companies that are trying to build the foundation um, to be a good finance company. And and it's freaking hard to do that. I've been at it for seven years here and I feel like, you know, I'm not past the fourth inning um, of the journey. Um, there's a lot to learn. Uh, there's a lot of ways you can make mistakes. You lend a lot of money to make a little Um and, you know, there's just a lot of risks um, uh, as well in, you know, in the technology environment that we're in, um, uh, the access to information. Uh, and so I think Alpha offers a great opportunity for leaders to tap into very specific, um, important learnings, um, tap into experts um for help on things um i just sent my cfo to the um finance conference that's going on in nashville i think it's still going on there i think um and uh this week and um and you know he we had a problem with sales sales tax management because we're now operating in 47 states and we weren't before <laughs> And we're doing, you know, different types of leases and so on. And it's complex because all the states have different rules. Yeah. And um, he's met a number of peers that he can tap into. Um, he's realizing there are specialists in this field that he's met at this conference. And he said, you know, I accelerated forward in what would have taken me months just attending the conference. Yeah. And... Um, and so I think it's terrific. And um, uh, I think, you know, it's great that somehow the leadership, I don't know if that was Ralph historically or or who I should give the credit to, but there was a leadership, I think, in that in that association in the last 20 years that has really elevated uh, the depth and the opportunities that exist for people to come into this industry and to tap into that association and to accelerate forward. Um, and so I'm, I'm a big cheerleader if I haven't made that clear. <laughs> nope. Um, I definitely understand Howard and, um, you know, it's, I'm going on almost 20 years now in the industry and I owe a lot of my success to, um, you know, what the ELFA has provided me from a, not only a networking perspective, obviously relationships are huge um, in any industry, but also from an educational perspective, um, just collaborating with peers and, you know, those different conferences that they have, the one that your CFO is just at in Nashville, um, definitely provide, um, you know, the, I guess, forum and I guess the uh, educational sessions. So we're up to date on what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So, um, yeah, I guess my next question is, um, you know, coming out of college, you really didn't know about the equipment finance industry. 
you know, 40 years later, I guess, what are your general thoughts on this uh, community, Howard? I think it's an, it's an area of finance that is still um, not well known uh, to those that aren't in it. Um, and, um, and I think we have to probably continue to grow that awareness. I think it, it should be a forward-looking objective of alpha leadership uh, to maybe invest more uh, in the university exposure uh, to some of the companies and the types of careers uh, that exist there. I think we're probably, I don't give us a very high grade there yet. Um, oh. And um, I've tried, but it's definitely, it's, uh, it's pedaling uphill. Um, so I think, I think there's a lot of opportunity there because it's not, um, you know, none of my, I've got, uh, one in college, I've got one about to go to college. Um, they, they're not talking too much about equipment finance as one of their career opportunities, you know, um, <laughs> you know, I got one, you know, um, that, uh, is talking about, you know, participating in a hedge fund. And when I asked what a hedge fund was, they said, I don't know. Um, but I think, you know, you, 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 you hear about cooler things being investment bankers and hedge funds and, um, sure. wall street and, um, uh, and you see a lot of the wealth creation that's happened, um, in the past 10 to 20 years, um, has been very technology focused, um, some banker focus, I guess, but probably more. You would have been better to be an engineer and go to NVIDIA um, uh, and get some options. And uh, I just think this is a terrific arena for people to have a lot of options uh, to deploy their skills and, you know, from sales to other skills, um, because there's just an enormous continuing need for capital. And it's one of those industries that I think are going to be around for a very long time. Um, however, technology helps change it. Um, I, I still think, um, at least in the 40 years that I've been in it, uh, uh, the fundamentals in terms of what customers want actually haven't changed much, right? Um, sure. They need capital to buy equipment that they're going to be making money with. It's really important to them. They want that process to be fairly easy and painless and to get a fair deal. And um, uh, and that's easy from their perspective and very hard from a lender's perspective. And um, and 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 so I think there's there's going to be a continuing need, a continuing opportunity for professionals um, to develop expertise in the space and really be able to make a good living. Um, and, and one of the things that I've loved about the space is that, you know, you have to learn credit and um, that means you have to learn about a lot of different types of companies uh, in underwriting those credits. And uh, I think it's made me probably a better all around business person and created more opportunity for me because of the exposure you get to everything from farmers to transportation companies to manufacturing to technology. And um, and I think that's hard to get in other places. Um, sure. And uh, and so, you know, I, um, I haven't figured out to leave something to my kids. I'm not sure that they want to follow me in equipment finance, um, <laughs> but um, it wouldn't be a terrible option for them. I know that. No, um, and I know like the ELFA is investing heavily in the campus, the careers. I don't know if you've had the opportunity to do a guest lecture um, yet, but next time in Southern California, if you want to do one, I've done a handful of them um, here at ASU. Uh, they're 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 fun, but yeah, I mean, you sit in a, a room full of you know business students, and they're just like, why would I want to finance that? Why would I want to lease that? Why don't I just pay cash and get a better price? <laughs> it's like, oh, come on. All right, here we go. But um, uh, anyhow, all, all good points, Howard, for sure. Yeah. Um, 
I, I ask everyone um, who comes on the program to give me a little uh, fun fact about themselves. So, um, you know, outside of equipment finance, what else does Howard like to do? Well, I told you about my passion for sailboat racing and I, uh, um, and I, I, I probably most enjoy flying and, I um, you know, I, I grew up, uh, in, in the middle of nowhere, New Hampshire, um, growing up on a grass airstrip because my dad was a pilot. And so I learned to fly at a young age and I'm, I'm still flying and, um, love to do that and i actually fly myself around for work quite a bit now uh which is a lot better to me than getting on the airlines or in a long car drive so um that's uh so you fly from santa barbara to rancho uh i fly all over the place from santa barbara to rancho to in fact i'm awesome. i'm i'm, I'm going to be in the air about 30 minutes after we're done with our talk um <laughs> going, to see, going to see a customer um up to san francisco out to vegas to Salt Lake City and um, uh, down to Arizona, um, you know, those are all within a decent radius for me. And, um, sure. and it's a, you know, it's a great time saver for me. And it's, it's a lot nicer way to spend the day than, uh, than, than uh, working through LAX. <laughs> Completely understand. And, um, you know, the next time after this, you're in Arizona, let me know. Would love to, I will. love to go up, would love to go up in the plane and meet you for coffee or wherever. Oh, that's fantastic. For sure. For sure. Um, my last uh, you know, question I have for you, sir, is, um, you know, why should someone want to do business with Howard and Crossroads Equipment Finance? Hmm. Well, I think um, for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, we started talking a little bit about culture and um, I'm rather maniacally focused on trying to do the best I can of building a great team to serve customers, uh, people with high integrity that are going to work hard to try and help customers get the things that they need and do things the right way the first time. Um, we recently um, uh, went through the best place to work process and were graded and and got an outstanding grade in the in the low nineties. Um, and um, uh, and so it was it was a nice thing to pat ourselves on the back about, but also gave us some very specific feedback in terms of what employees thought about the place they work. Um, and we're trying to build on on that and trying to improve our grade yet. But I feel like, you know, in equipment finance in particular, that I, I mentioned things haven't changed that much in 40 years. The fundamental needs of customers are still there. We're not invent we're not building Teslas. We're trying to send people to Mars. We're we're providing capital, and it's a service business, and um, and service is provided by people. And the and uh, and so I feel like if if we continue to focus on having a great business culture, when you do business with us, you're going to be doing business with people that are proud of where they work. Um, that want to do the right thing, uh, that want to give you the things that you need and do it at a very high integrity level. And uh, things will shake out. Um, uh, you'll be interested in continuing to do business with us. And so um, we're pretty maniacally focused on that. I Somebody said to me once, you know, if you get the right team in place, you can kind of screw up everything else because the team's going to take care of everything. <laughs> and... Um, and, and I've learned in the different jobs that I've been in, when I didn't have the team, even if I thought I had a brilliant strategy, um, uh, I couldn't be successful. I loved when Hewlett and Packard started their business. Um, one of the quotes from uh, Mr. Packard was when, when asked, so what was your strategy for starting HP? And he said, oh, we had no strategy. We just got a bunch of guys together that we had gone to school with that were new or smart that we could build a good company with. And we started. And um, and so they started with the team instead of starting with some fantastic business vision and um, and probably why they built a great company. And uh, I think there's lots of things that you can do in business. I think there's a lots of options that we have to continue to grow, but it will all be built upon 
the quality of the culture you create so that the people are excited to get up in the morning and come to work uh, and do the right thing. Um, and you can have success then. Well, thank you very much, Howard, uh, for that. I uh, really appreciate your time today, sir. Um, assuming our paths will probably cross uh, late October at the yeah. ELFA annual. For sure. Um, so make sure I get some of your time down there. And I really appreciate you being on the program, sir. Thanks, Jesse. Nice chatting with you. All right. We'll talk soon, Howard. Thank you. Okay. Take care.